Got a couple of young preachers there coming up, don't we? Wow. Kids say the craziest things. We'll have to call Art Art Linklater, I suppose. All right. But praise God they're in church this morning. You know? Praise, praise the Lord they're here. And you know, talking about the Bible, quoting Scripture, knowing the Gospel. You know, those are the very important things. And you know, we need more kids in here. Fill this place up with children. Bring them all. Grab them on the street. Raid your neighbor's house and grab them kids too. I don't know. People need to know the Lord, and it starts, you know, this generation. Oh, my goodness. These kids need to know the Lord. It's good to be here this morning, and thank you for being here this morning. And It's just great that we can rejoice in the Lord, even if we do live in Michigan, and it snows in May. What do you do? Just a couple of, uh, a couple of prayer requests. Uh, Vicki's husband, Tim, Big is having surgery this Tuesday. It's a spinal surgery, isn't it? Yes. So that'll be Tuesday at Lansing, so we want to keep Tim in our prayers. Uh, Wally Moore's surgery on his neck as well. That's coming up. That was the 18th of May. He got a phone call. They've moved it to this coming Friday. So I'll be praying for Wally that he'll have that done uh, this weekend, this coming Friday. He'll be able to get it done. So praise the Lord for moving that up. And uh, we also want to continue to pray for... Uh, our military, you know, we had the, there was a terrible crash there in Alabama. There was one recently in Alaska. Two uh, Apache helicopters have collided and uh, folks have died there. And uh, Doris Cheney, uh, you remember Doris, maybe Doris Shumway, uh, she's having heart surgery tomorrow. So we want to keep these folks in our prayers. The military families have lost their loved ones. Uh, pray for our country. Pray for one another. I tell you, we're, we're in desperate times, aren't we? Father, this morning we want to thank you that you are a faithful God. Lord, thank you that you've given us your word and we know that your word is sure. And in spite of the circumstances in the world today, in spite of the cancer and the sickness and the diseases and the, just the lawlessness that seems to be so prevalent in the world today, Lord, we rejoice in knowing that you came to this earth and died for our sins and that you were buried and rose again on the third day according to the scriptures and that you promised that you'd come back and receive us unto yourself, and that there would be a day when you return and you'll make all things right. But until then, Father, we pray that as we look into your word, you would encourage our hearts today, that you'd receive honor and glory and praise, not just here, but around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 5. We've been going over the, the Beatitudes... The Sermon on the Mount, we started. Um, Jesus is with his disciples. He's in the plains of uh, Galilee there, just near the Sea of Galilee in Capernaum. And he goes up into a mountain. Uh, and there he sat down and he began to teach. This passage of, of Scripture, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, is referred to as the uh, Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus is teaching and when we read this passage, when we read these things that he's saying, once again, we truly want to put ourselves there in that position. God's Word tells us that God's Word is profitable uh, for correction, for teaching, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished or mature and equipped. So it's for us. He's speaking to us today. The Sermon on the Mount was spoken almost 2,000 years ago, but the words resonate with us today. The truth, God's truth is applicable. You know, the world today would like us to believe that truth is uh, irrelevant. Well, I guess it's relevant to you as an individual, but your truth isn't my truth, and so on and so forth. We, we see a big attack on truth in the world today, and you don't know when you watch the news if you're seeing the truth or not. How, who do you trust? What do you believe? Uh, what you read, what you see, all of these things. There's so much deception in the world uh, today, which are truly signs of the end times that Christ warned about, that in the last days, many false prophets, false Christs would come. He told us to be as wise as serpents, harmless as doves. He told us not to be deceived. 
And it's easy to be deceived in the world in which we're living today because there's so much false, uh, falseness, uh, mistruth, half-truths, which is a good lie, really, isn't it? Jesus sat with his disciples and he gave them these blessings, this, the beatitudes, the be happy attitudes. The little guy said this morning about how do you rejoice? Have a good attitude. Whew. I don't know that. To hear that from an 11-year-old is pretty amazing. Of course, I heard it all the time when I was a little kid. You need to have a good attitude. <laughs> you got a bad attitude. I guess I had a bad attitude a lot when I was a kid. I don't know. But, but it's about the attitude of the heart. And when we look at the Beatitudes, that little quaint saying, the be happy attitudes, the word Beatitude, literally happy, not the Hollywood happy, not the worldly happiness, not the happiness that comes from getting what you asked for, for your birthday or for Christmas, but rather it's a divine word. It's a word that represents that inner contentment, that inward peace and satisfaction and contentment no matter what the outward circumstances are. This is a word, this word beatitude here. This is a happiness that's, that's produced in us. It's not produced within us. Uh, it's God in us producing it. We can't, we can't. We try to be happy. We tell our kids to be happy. In fact, my wife had a big wooden spoon when our kids were little. And on the big part of the spoon, she had a big smiley face painted on it. And on the handle, it was called the happy spoon. Some parents called it a paddle. Our kids called it the happy spoon. Are you happy? No. Do you want me to get the happy spoon and make you happy? No. I'll be happy. <laughs> But let's just, let's just run down these Beatitudes just to refresh our memory from last Sunday. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. And so as Jesus sat there in the Mount of Blessing that, that afternoon. And as he taught the people, he began with these beatitudes. And what we see here is not an equation for how to get to heaven. Because there's no man that can be these things. Not within himself. These beatitudes are the characteristic of God himself. And these are the characteristics of the man that is in Christ. Christ in the man. God producing that which is godly within us. It starts off with being poor in spirit. That recognition of a man when he comes to the self-realization that he cannot save himself. Blessed are they who mourn. Mourn for our sin. The Old Testament saints, you know, when, when they were confronted with their sin, they put on sackcloth and ashes. Job said, I loathe myself. I hate myself. I hate my sin. But what do we see in the world today? Instead of a loathing of sin, instead of a, a repentance and a mourning, uh, grieving for our sin. What do, we, what do we see? We see a celebration of sin in the world today. People are rejoicing in their ungodliness. People are rejoicing in the sinfulness. We call it liberty and, and uh, uh, progressiveness. All sorts of things. Blessed are those who mourn. Do you recognize your sin? Do you recognize your need? Do you recognize like the poor man, the the sinner who went to the wall to pray. And as he was there praying, he wouldn't, even open, he wouldn't even lift his eyes towards heaven. And he smote himself upon his chest. Oh, woe is me. I'm not, even, I'm not worthy. God forgive me, a sinner. Or like the Pharisee who was there praying alongside of him, who looked at the sinner and said, God, thank you that I'm not like that guy. And he began to boast of his own self-righteousness. God said, which of the two was justified? Which one went home justified? 
It was the poor sinner. It was the poor in spirit. It was the needy. It was the man who mourned his sin. And it's that work that God does in us that brings us to this place. The pure in heart shall see God. The pureness of our heart isn't something that you get out the lye soap, you know, and you start scrubbing on it. Or you get baptized and you get swished around in the water a little bit, wash that sin away. No! No, the pureness of heart comes from the presence of God in your heart, in your spirit. It's that cleansing that comes from the shed blood of Jesus Christ. He goes on in this morning, our text there, verse 9. Uh, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Boy, what do we need in the world today? We need peace. <laughs> you know, the Hebrew word for peace, the Hebrew word for peace, shalom. You guys know that, right? Shalom. It's a common way to greet one another. If you're in Israel uh, and you run up to somebody on the side, somebody meets you, they're going to say to you probably shalom. It's a greeting, but it's also what you say when you leave as well. Shalom. Uh, it's the greeting and it's the, the saying goodbye as well. Shalom. What does shalom mean? What's your understanding of the word shalom? Peace, right? Shalom. The word means peace, but it means much more than just peace. Shalom in the Hebrew. It has a, a, a huge, deep, beautiful meaning. When you think about peace, the peace of God, peace with God. In the book of Exodus, chapters 21 and 22, the word shalom is used 14 different times. 14 different times in the book of Exodus, chapters 21 and 22. Uh, it's translated, now listen, it's translated, the word shalom is translated in the English as to make it good. He shall surely pay, make full restitution, or to restore. You think, how do you get that out of shalom? The meaning of shalom, the wholeness, to make something whole again, to renew something, to make it complete. You see, in the Jewish greeting, when you say shalom, literally what you're saying to somebody is, may you be full of well-being. May you be whole. May you have health and prosperity. Shalom. Fullness, wholeness, completeness, health, prosperity. That is the idea behind the greeting of shalom in Hebrew. In Exodus, when Moses there uses or the word translated 14 different times in shalom, what is he dealing with? What's he talking about? The Levitical law of restitution. Here he's talking about the instructions. Moses is instructing the people on how to deal with offenses. Anybody ever be offended? Anybody here ever get offended? Anybody ever been offended? Have you ever offended anybody? Oh, boy, you guys are honest this morning. I'm encouraged. How to deal with offenses. Scripture tells us that offenses are going to come. People are going to be offended. Sometimes people are offended at you just because you're you. And what can you do about you? <laughs> they're offended by your shoes. Jack, they're offended by your haircut. <laughs> you know, what did we read last week? Can the Ethiopian change his skin? Can a leopard change his spots? Sometimes people are offended where there is no offense. They just don't like you. People just get offended, and people are easily offended. Scripture tells us that as a Christian, we are not to be easily offended. But when it happens, what are we supposed to do? When you get offended, what are you supposed to do? When you offend somebody, what are you supposed to do? Well, in Exodus... Uh, Moses is given the instructions on what uh, they were supposed to do when somebody caused personal loss or injury. And it's interesting to note that the person 
who caused the offense, the guilty guy. He was the one who was to make things right, and he was to restore that which was lost to the offended man. And they considered the offended man as being less than complete, less than holy. He was robbed. He was stolen. He was offended. He was hurt. Somebody in his family was killed. Something happened. And that refers to more than just a physical restitution. It actually carries a greater meaning than just the, you stole my goat, so you got to give me three back. You're making me more than what I was in the beginning. It has to do with more than just the physical restoration, but the emotional and the mental. Maybe that's why lawyers come up with these lawsuits, you know. But it is a restitution, a repayment, a making of whole. Shalom. Shalom. Was God ever offended? Have you ever offended God? Have you ever been offended by God? How many times when we suffer great loss do we say, God, what are you doing? You know, a lot of folks shipwreck in their faith because of their anger towards God. The loss of a child or the loss of a spouse. And that kind of pain, that kind of suffering, that kind of hurt brings about all kinds of animosity and ill feelings and hurt. And unfortunately, a lot of people never really heal from that hurt. God was offended. Man offended God in the very beginning. It was in the Garden of Eden. God made man. God made man after the image of himself. In the glory of God created he them, male and female. He created a beautiful world for them to dwell in. He made a special garden and everything there was for the betterment of man. He placed man in the garden and said everything you can eat of, so on and so forth. You guys know the story except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Thou shalt not eat it. Because in the day that you eat it, there's going to be some serious consequences. Did you ever tell that to your kid? You do that again, you're going to get it. You better not do that or else. You know how many times my dad had to say to me, or else, before I finally got the else? <laughs> I kind of thought I'd learned my lesson. But God speaks. And God gave warning. God gave notice. God created Adam and Eve. And he told them, don't eat it. Because the first time, the only time you eat it, you will die. Man offended God in the Garden of Eden when man chose to disobey and disregard all that God had said. When Adam disobeyed God, God was the offense was towards God. And the law that God had given, man had broken. That is an offense. It was David who prayed. When you read about David's great sin with Bathsheba, and when God finally brought David to the place of repentance, when David finally came to that place where he was poor in spirit, and where he mourned for his sin, where he longed for righteousness and goodness. When God finally brought him to that place, what was David's great confession of his sin? Against thee, God, have I sinned against thee. Do we recognize who we sin against? Do we recognize who we're really offending? What was Jesus' statement about uh, little children? Let the, let the little children come unto me, right? And he who gives a little child a, a cold glass of water in my name, who is he really giving it to? If you give a kid a glass of water in Jesus' name, who are you really giving it to? Remember what Jesus said? You're giving it to me. Remember what Jesus said? When you saw me naked, you clothed me. When you saw me hungry, you fed me. And they said, when did we ever see you naked? When did we ever see you hungry? Or did we ever see you homeless? And Jesus said, for as much as you haven't done it unto one of these little ones, you didn't do it unto me. But as much as you've done it unto them, you've done it unto me. Listen, our attitude 
in an act of rebellious, uh, a state of rebellion, pride, selfishness, whatever. These are, these are sins against God. These are an offense against God. And because of that, humanity was placed outside of the Garden of Eden. God made this beautiful garden. Man was in promise. Man was in relationship. He disobeyed God. God took him out of the garden. And because of that, he brought forth enmity, war between God and man. War between God and mankind. Scripture tells us in Romans chapter 5 and verse 10, before you're saved, before a man is saved, we are called the enemy of God. We were enemies to God. But you know what? When you look at the Garden of Eden, when you look at Adam and Eve's life, and you look at their rebellion, and you look at the war that followed, that's not where it began. You know, we often say, you know, the book of Genesis is the book of beginnings. But that's really not where it started. If you have your Bibles, turn over to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 14. Where did this war start? Where did this war, where did this strife begin? It started with Satan. It started with the devil. That archangel whose name was Lucifer. How art thou fallen? Verse 12, chapter 14, it starts off. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will set upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Do you notice the five I wills there? The devil's five I wills. This is a war. Listen, the world is engaged in a war. The world is at enmity with God. It's a spiritual war. It started with Satan. He entered into the garden. He deceived Eve. Man bought into the lie, willfully disobeyed God, and he brought that war right to our front step. And so today, we fight. Mankind fights against God. Conflict. Conflict. Conflict everywhere. And this battle is fought on three different fronts. You have the Eastern Front, the Russian Front, the no. Three different fronts that we face this battle. First of all, it's the war with God. The natural man said in his heart, there is no God. Psalms 14, 11. Why? Because they work immorality. It says because they are corrupt. Because they are wicked and their acts are wicked. Mankind in his wickedness has entered into a war with God himself. Good versus evil, I guess, right? But it's a battle that starts within our heart with God. Don't tell me what to do. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. Pride. Pride and then hate. And then what's the result? Murder. The battle is with God. It starts off with God. And then it starts within man's heart. There's a war that's being fought in your heart right now as you're sitting here this morning. There's a battle going on between your flesh and your spirit. If you're saved this morning, you're experiencing this conflict between the Spirit of God in you and the old man, the carnal nature. So there's that second front that we fight against our own... Remember what the Apostle Paul said about his own heart? Oh, wretched man that I am. The good that I want to do, I don't. The bad I don't want to do, I do. Anybody ever wake up in the morning and have that kind of experience? There's a spiritual war. There's a conflict that goes on. And this inner conflict in mankind, this war within our hearts. If you turn over to the book of James, the brother of the Lord addresses this, this battle. This war. He asks the question from whence, in, in uh, James chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, he asks the question from whence come wars 
and fightings among you. Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members and your heart? You lust and you have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and you war. You have not because you ask not. And you ask and you receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. That, that selfish heart desire to get what I want. I like, I think it's Bob Smith. Got a famous little quote. The flesh will not be denied. Your old nature, man, it's constantly fighting for preeminence. Me first, me first, me first. And if you don't believe that's the condition of the human heart, once again, go back to the nursery and just observe those little guys. Me, me, me. That's the human nature. That's my heart. It's all about me. And then there's that war. You know, it starts with this animosity towards God and towards what's right. And we are in a war today against the, the world is fighting against that which is right. Governments around the world are passing laws and bills that are wrong, morally wrong, biblically wrong. But people are buying into them. As long as it's legal, I guess it's okay. No, it's not. And there's this fight, and it takes place. It starts with this battle against God and everything that's true and everything that's good and everything that's right. And then it goes, it's in our own heart where we're constantly fighting ourselves. We know what to do. We don't do it. The Bible says, he who knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is what? Sin. You ever wonder what sin is? Just do the opposite of what you know what you're supposed to do. That's a sin. Sin in the heart of man. Waging war in our mind. And it spills out of our heart, and where does it spill out to? When that inner war is taking place, when, it, when it's going on inside us, and all of a sudden we find it coming out. And what did Jesus, what did we talk about Jesus last Sunday? Where does the, uh, what comes out of the heart? Adulteries, murders, and fightings, all of the things come out of the man. That's what comes out of us. And when it comes out of us, where does it fall? Where does it land? Whoever's sitting beside you, your neighbor, your wife, this battle on three fronts, it's against God, it's within ourselves, and it's against our community. It's against our neighbors. We have nations fighting against nations. We have uh, race fighting against race. We have husbands fighting against wives, wives fighting against husbands, family against family, neighbor against neighbor. State against Michigan. No. No. Yeah. State versus Michigan. We have conflict constantly in the world around us. We are constantly in a state of war. And for the Christian, you are not exempt. Because if you're walking in the flesh, if you're walking according to your carnal nature, Paul warned us, Walk in the spirit, not in the flesh, because if you walk in the flesh, the fruit of the flesh, the results of the flesh, there are going to be manifested. That's what's going to come out. The hate, the lying, the stealing, the killing, the murder, and the adultery, and the stealing, all of those corrupt things. That's what's going to be the result. That's what's going to come out. And that affects those people that we live with. That affects the people that we are around. Nation against nation. The pride... The devil had a heart that was lifted up with pride. And in that pride, that pride turned towards a hatred towards God. And that hatred that he had towards God turned into murder. Jesus said he was a liar from the beginning and a murderer from the beginning. John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus concerning, uh, Jesus speaking concerning the devil, called him a thief. Jesus as the good shepherd, Satan as the thief. The thief comes only to do three things kill, steal, and destroy. Take away the peace of God, take away peace with God, and that's what he robbed mankind of. This conflict, it's a history of our, it's a history of mankind. It has been since man's disobedience in the garden has been a continual story of conflict, continually. In the world today, because of this hate, because of this pride, because of the murder that's being taken, that's taking place all around the world in our cities, becoming unsafe, 
kids, 11-year-old kids, 12-year-old kids getting guns, getting knives, whatever. And uh, if, they don't have, if they can't steal a gun or find a gun, they'll use a knife. And if they can't find a knife or steal a knife, they'll use a baseball bat. And a person who can't find one of those things and is bent on killing somebody, he's going to start his car up and he's going to drive through the crowds and he's going to kill people that way. Listen, we're living in an in a unprecedented time of ungodliness and it's a time in which man has blatantly shook their fist at the face of God and said, there is no God. We don't want God. Kick him out of our schools. Kick him out of our government. Kick him out of our lives. Kick him out of your marriage. Kick him out of your relationships. Did you know that the world is on the brink of Armageddon right now today? Listen, that final great war is just down the road. I don't mean to scare anybody. Well, maybe I do. Maybe we need to be scared. I don't know. But listen, we have to pay attention to what's going on in the world today. The world has turned its back on God and it's fighting Christianity. The laws are being instituted and framed to, conf to uh, actually confront and confine Christianity, and Christians are being targeted. That's been going on for years and generations around the world, and now it's starting to happen in America, here. There was a man who was walking around with a placard a few years ago in Dearborn. Dearborn, Michigan. He had a sign, Jesus saves. He was witnessing to the Muslims. You know what, you know what happened to that guy? He got arrested and put in jail. Yeah, because he was preaching Jesus in a Muslim town. Listen, we, we are living in a very exciting time. Exciting in the sense that the scriptures that speak about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, he is coming. And he's coming soon. But on the other side of the coin, the deception and the conflict and the killing and all of these things that are taking place in America today and around the world... Those are the things that, are, that accompany this age of, what, what, did you, what is it called in Scripture? Age of lawlessness. And that's what we're seeing. Lawlessness. Listen, when you turn your back on God's law, you turn your back on all that's right and all that's good and all that's proper. And it's only going to create, what is it? Chaos. And what do we see today? Chaos. Jesus said the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. But, hallelujah, Jesus said he came as the good shepherd. And what did he come to do? He said, I am come that you might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Shalom. In the world, he said, you're going to have tribulation, but in me, you're going to have peace. He told his disciples, I'm leaving, but my peace I leave with you. Not as the world gives. You know, the world tries to come up with peace. John 14, 27, but my peace I give unto you, God's peace, peace with God and the peace of God, that peace that keeps our hearts and minds through all of the struggles and all of the trials and all of the persecutions and all of the stuff that's going on in the world today, the child of God can have true peace in the midst of all of these things. When Jesus first met with his disciples, remember Christ was crucified. Sunday morning, he rose from the grave. He... Uh, was seen by the two disciples on the way to Emmaus. That evening, in the evening, he went back to Jer He goes back and he meets with where the disciples are all gathered together. John chapter 20, verse 19. Jesus came and he stood in the midst of them and he said unto them, Shalom. Peace be unto you. God's peace. May you be whole. May you be restored. There has been restitution. You know, there can be no peace without God. There can be no peace on earth without God. There's no inner peace for the man or woman without God. There's no peace with your wife. There's no peace with your husband. I better throw that in there. There's no peace, father and son, son and brother, and brother and sister, and mom and dad. And There is no peace in our relationships apart from our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we let that relationship slide, when we, when we allow that sin, that pride and hate and, and murder, when we allow those things to enter into our hearts, our relationship with Jesus Christ, that fellowship that we have with him 
is broken. We're no longer walking in obedience and dependence upon him. We're winging it. We're going it alone. And we're going to be destroyed. There can be no peace. In the law of Moses, there in Exodus chapter 20 and 21, you know, it was the offender. It was the guilty guy. He was the guy who was supposed to take the initiative and provide full restitution and to make peace between the two. But mankind doesn't have it in him. We don't have it. But thank God he does. Because it was God who came. It was God who sought us. It's God who seeks you this morning. So that that which was taken away in Adam, that which was broken in Adam, that which is destroyed because of sin would be wholly restored to you through the Lord Jesus Christ. He has that restoration that making peace. You know, the League of Nations? You ever hear of that? The League of Nations? The League of Nations began in 1919. It was formed after World War I so that the world would be in a state of peace. No more wars. Stop Nazism and, and all those other isms. You know, there was a lot of good intentions, I suppose, in the League of Nations. But you know what, the, you know what happened to the League of Nations? It failed. It failed. The world got together. The world formed a league. The form, they formed a group of nations. And we we're going to bring peace to the world. It failed. So what was brought in its place? The United Nations. Anybody ever see the emblem of the United Nations? You know what that looks like? Oh, hey, there it is. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, April. You recognize that? The League of Nations? Did you know anybody ever hear of Henry Kissinger? The greatest peacemaker on earth? Guess what? He failed. The United Nations has failed in bringing peace to the world. What are those things? So you have the five circles, you have the incentric, you have the world there from a northern viewpoint, and then you have those things on the outside. It looks like wheat or something. Do you know what those are? What are those? What are those two branches on the outside there? Olive branches. They're olive branches. You know, when, God, when man rejected God, as mankind, as our governments have turned from God, they have sealed our doom. If, if this is your hope of world peace, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Isaiah 48, 22 says, There is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. There is no peace. Mankind, mankind tries. We try, we try, we try, but there's only one true prince of peace, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. That logo, the olive branches, you see the two olive branches on either side of that. Why olive branch? Why an olive Why olive branches? What's the significance of the olive branch? What's the importance of the symbolism of the dove and the olive branch? Well, it may not be what you think. I looked it up. And I was not really amazed at what I found. It says the olive branches since ancient times, or rather to be more precise, since the time of ancient Greece, they have meant peace. Therefore, the fact that the olive branches surround the map of the world clearly symbolizes what all of the efforts of the United Nations are aimed at. World peace. Oh, that sounds great, but you know what? It's not true. Olive branches, the symbolism of the olive branch precisely started with these pagan Greeks this symbol of the dove representing peace started with some pagan Greeks or some Roman uh, representing some Roman god thing. Where did the olive branch and the, and the dove really first come on the scene? Hey, what was that? You guys know your Bible. You got to go all the way back to the book of Genesis. God brought a flood upon the earth. Why? Because God was offended at the offenses of mankind. And it repented God that he'd made man. And God chose to destroy the world and everybody and everything in it. 
And God brought harsh judgment upon the earth. But there was one man, hallelujah, his name was Noah, and he found grace. He found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And the Lord told him to build a boat, right? Thank God he built the boat. And God brought Noah and his family through the flood of judgment upon the world. And it was at the end of the flood, the ark rested in the mounts of Ararat, and the sky cleared and the wind blew and the ground began to dry up. Noah sent out a raven. That didn't work. He sent out a dove. And it's fascinating to me to think about that dove in the evening. In the evening, the dove came back. And what did the dove have in its mouth? An olive branch. Shalom. Noah knew that it was over. The wrath of God had been propitiated. The peace of God, peace with God has been restored. The world was once again being made whole. The olive branch and the dove represented that peace, God's peace that he had restored to mankind because of his judgment, his righteous judgment being satisfied. We call that in the Bible, the word is called propitiation. God chose those things, not some pagan Greek. They just copied it. But what does the world want to do today? They exchange the truth of God for a lie. That's a lie. They're going to fail. They will fail. There's going to be another man who's going to come on the scene. His name 666, right? The Antichrist. And he's going to bring in world peace. Ah, wrong. He'll fail. There's only, the only real peace that's going to come is when Jesus Christ returns. I talked to a Jewish rabbi once a few years ago, and he said the only peace that we have for the world, the only peace that can bring, the only hope that we have for peace in the world is when we get our temple built. That will bring peace. Wrong. Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, He's the only one who will provide peace for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. I've got 14 more points, another 35 minutes to go. <laughs> and then they're just getting warmed up. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God, the true worshipers of God. What does it mean to be a peacemaker? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 through 21. Look that up and read it. Next week we'll finish it. You have in your hand the greatest peace treaty. Listen, this is the greatest peace treaty that has ever been written. Because this is the peace treaty that provides peace with God and the peace of God and the inner peace that we so desire. If you're going to love your neighbor, you're going to love your wife, you're going to love your husband, you're going to love your children, you're going to get along with your neighbor, you're going to give up that hate, that unforgiveness, that self-centered spirit. It comes with that declaration of peace. For in Jesus Christ, we have received peace, his peace, nothing else. Father, this morning, we thank you that you have provided peace for the world. That Jesus Christ is the propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but for the sins of the entire world. Jew and Gentile alike, black and white, Russian, Chinese, American, it makes no difference. Creed, race, or color. Jesus, you came and you died for all. Because your word tells us we were all dead, spiritually separated, in a state of war and rebellion against you, against ourselves, and against one another. That the devil brought chaos into this world, but you've brought peace in the midst of chaos. Father, we pray this morning that you would restore and renew and make us whole. That we would experience in our hearts, our daily walk with you, that peace, that peace that passeth all understanding. As your word says, thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee, not upon the flesh, not upon the things of this world, not upon my selfish desires and ambitions not my petty, carnal flesh, but upon you.
because you love me, because you love us, and you gave yourself for us. Lord, we know there will be a day. We know it's going to get worse before it gets better, but we know that there will be a day of ultimate triumphal peace. And that'll happen when you return. But until then, God, may we be those faithful ambassadors to bring that word of peace, that promise of reconciliation to a lost and a dying world, a world that doesn't want to hear it, people who don't care, people who hate us. Father, help us. May your life shine through us and your love reach out to those that are around us, Father, that they too would see the truth, believe the truth, and be saved and be brought into that place of peace and rest with you. Use us for your kingdom, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.